Hello, YA and dystopian future fans, and welcome to Ruth Fox's Under the Heavens. I'm Abigail, and this is CamCat Unwrapped. Bubbly's social media star, Hannah Monksman, has been chosen to captain a spaceship carrying the last of Earth's whales to a new paradise planet, New Eden. The only problem is that Hannah isn't who she says she is. Her real name is Kim Tang, and she's an undercover operative for a group of radicals who believe New Eden should be left untouched by humans. During their travels, Kim begins to form a close bond with the whales in her care, and their mental link allows for conversations on the lonely spaceship. But when one of the whales, Adonai, begins acting strange, Kim begins to suspect that she is a pawn in a secret mission to ensure that the whales never reach their destination. Under the Heavens is an unputdownable, futuristic tale with biblical themes that's sure to keep you on the edge of your captain's chair. It's a book to live in. Pack your bags, space explorers, and get ready to join the crew of the spaceship, Seiki. This story is taking off in five, four, three, two, one. CamCat Publishing presents Under the Heavens by Ruth Fox Narrated by Emily Wu Zeller For Ryder, Quinn, and Whitley Chapter 1 Hi, all you folks back on Earth! This is Hannah Monksman, checking in with another update for you on the Ark Project and your favorite whales and the most important mission ever undertaken by the human race. Gosh, that sounds so strange. To think that I've been chosen for this? Just so you know, Tobias tried to give me a fish yesterday. He held it up to the aquarium wall, clenched in his teeth. I had to tell him again that I couldn't breach the containment of the tank. Not without good reason. That's one of the toughest things about being in charge of creatures like this. I guess I'm going to envy all those people who come after me. In other arcs, carrying other creatures. Elephants, tigers, zebra, antelopes. Land mammals, apart from the dangerous ones, can be touched. You can physically put your hands on them. But there's always going to be a barrier between me and the whales. To answer the question sent in by Zara from Russia, I guess the link makes up for the loneliness. I get to hear the whales, feel them. I know where each of them is, unless they don't want me to. I can see through their eyes. But still, it's like having a best friend living in an isolation ward. You just want to give them a hug. And you can't. She paused the recording and closed her eyes, fighting to choke down the sense of revulsion rising in her, blocking out the hologram of her own face that hovered in the air in front of her parroting her words like a bad mimic. God, who was this bright-eyed, bubbly stranger? She sounded like a moron. Just get it over with, she told herself. Pressing her lips together, she resumed the recording. Well, I have a few boring chores to slog my way through. I'll have more for you tomorrow. Don't go anywhere. This is Hannah Monksman on the morning of July 3rd, 2078, signing off. She ceased the recording, pushing the translucent floating window aside with a swipe of one hand and allowing the projected image of her own face to disappear back into her tablet. Her bowl of soup took its place, steaming malodorously. Now at least she could get on with her day. And she had something pressing to take care of. Something was wrong with Adonai. The computer told her differently. His vitals were fine, his temperature normal. He was making no movements that suggested he was distressed. Even if the computer's readouts weren't enough, the link told her there was nothing to worry about. It is fine, Adonai repeated through it every time she pressed him. It is all of it fine. The link couldn't lie. The slightest nuance of each whale's thought was conveyed to her through the quantum matrices that had been mapped onto her brain during her integration. But after 91 days on this ship, she knew it, and she couldn't ignore the nagging feeling for long. 
computer, she said, as she snagged her tool belt from a nearby bench and slung it around her waist. I'm heading to the aquarium. Aquarium maintenance is not scheduled for 0600, July 3, 2078, Kim. Kim. That was her name. She tended to forget it these days, after so long playing Hannah Monksman. Sighing, she pushed aside her bowl of tepid soup. It was another powdered, freeze-dried thing from a packet that tasted of nothing but salt. I know. I'm not doing maintenance. I must advise that it's preferable to adhere to schedules, Kim. That way, we can ensure the proper functioning of the ship and its components. There was always something slightly strange about the way the computer uttered pronouns. We always carried the same inflection as I. So, most of the time, did you. The result was something too close to sarcasm, as if everything it said carried with it a slight rebuke. She wondered if she could tinker with the vocal processors, similar to the way she had convinced it to override the name it used for her. After only a few days on Seiki, she hadn't been able to stand hearing it call her Hannah. She knew her way around a computer system, but she wasn't an expert coder. She was, on the other hand, very persuasive, and she had engaged the computer in a conversation about nicknames. Such names weren't used in official records, such as transmissions to other ships, she had explained, but it would help her feel more at home if it referred to her as Kim when it spoke to her directly. The computer assured her this was an acceptable request, and that any outwardly transmitted data from Seiki would not contain the informal designation. She shoved the idea of further alterations to the back of her mind, along with the tantalizing thought that one day she could stop pretending to be Hannah Monksman. Something else to do on a rainy day, she told herself with an inward smile. Perhaps, the computer continued. You could send one of the droids while you attend to your allotted tasks. You are scheduled to be in the operations center now and to begin your systems check of the interior tech droids at 1420 hours. Seiki will be fine if I slip down there for a half an hour, she said aloud, resisting the urge to roll her eyes. The computer could detect her gestures and had basic interpretation abilities. Keep me updated. She didn't make it a question because she was already on her way, up out of her chair, dumping her inedible soup down the drain and leaving the bowl to be rinsed by the auto washer, then swinging through the doorway that took her from the mess into the corridor. Kim, the computer protested plaintively, but she tapped the back of her left hand with her right drawing the kanji to deactivate its voice temporarily. She walked along the clanking decking, vague impressions of the deck below showing through the grated plates. Seiki, at 3,000 feet long from nose to tail, and almost a third of that in width and depth, was the largest ship she'd ever been aboard. Even in the comparatively narrow corridor, she felt an overwhelming sense of immensity. The passageway dipped down, then back up toward the tail of the ship. But Kim wasn't going that far. There were mag lifts there, but she'd use the ramps instead. It wasn't that she needed exercise, more that she'd started seizing any excuse to work out her body. The gravity aboard was 0.72 Gs, slightly less than Earth's gravity, slightly greater than Mars's. It always felt like she was doing less work than she should be, even when she was only buttering her toast. The access to the ramps was about halfway along the corridor. She didn't pause in her stride, but swung around the jam to begin her descent. The ramps spiraled upwards and downwards with a landing at each of the 19 decks, but most of those decks were empty space. She only really used six of them, and even then, only parts of those were even functional at this stage of the journey. Large sections of the ship were devoted to storage of equipment and construction materials, that would be used when they reached New Eden. And as such, they didn't require life support or regular maintenance. Feeling a fresh onrush of energy, most of which probably came from the pure fact of having something to occupy her mind, she began to jog. The ramp threaded its way through other ramps, some larger thoroughfares and others smaller, like the one she was on. Bridges joined them, 
You could reach any point on the ship from this nexus of walkways. The computer was right. She could have sent one of the droids. Even now, one of them was idling on the inward curve of a ramp as she circled one of the stanchions that ran through Seiki's core. It looked lost, lonely, and bored. If a creature made of electronics could be any of those things. It was one of the mid-size ones, designed for diagnostics and rudimentary repairs. It's head, a six-sided dome, pocked with small colored windows that made it look like a children's toy, swiveled as she passed, as if hopeful to be given a task. Still, this was a job she needed to complete on her own. The light dimmed the farther down she went. Deck 15, the lowest, was about six feet in height, but Deck 10, her destination, was five times that. The aquarium ran through the ship from deck 12 to deck 8, taking up varying amounts of space on each deck, and in some sections it was 200 feet from ceiling to floor. The lights were far overhead, even along these sections of the ramps. As they detected her motion and flickered on, they made the featureless gray deck look flat, as if she were looking at a painting on a wall rather than reality. As if to add to this dreamlike state, Adonai's voice echoed softly in her mind. No need to come closer. It is well. Little one, go back. Kim shook her head, as if Adonai could see or feel the gesture through the link. He couldn't, of course, but at times he was so strong inside her that she almost forgot. He had never been like the others. Ignoring him, because if anything, his protests only worried her more. She stepped from the ramp to the landing and crossed the bridge into deck 10. The cavernous space opened up around her as soon as she'd passed through the hexagonal doorway, and it was like plunging into the very depths of the ocean. It was the aquarium that made it seem that way. Shifting blue light wobbled over the bulkheads above her, painting her skin blue and bleaching all other colors from the spectrum. The light seemed to come from everywhere at once. The great tank rose up through the walls and ceiling, a masterpiece of engineering. It jutted out and curved inwards, narrower pillars and tunnels leading to wider open spaces. Some areas were flat glass, and others were bulging force fields. Dark shapes of aeration filters, thermostats, and feeding machinery made silhouettes against the deep blue backdrop and the waving fronds of seaweed and coral growing on the various ledges of artificial rock rippled like curtains billowing in the breeze. Fifteen was looking at Kim. He was a minky whale, one of the smallest of all whale species. Only the pygmy was smaller. Most minkies were a brown, gray, or purple shade, but Fifteen was white. She didn't know why exactly. His genetics didn't show anything unusual, such as albinism. His eyes were a normal color, deep black, instead of the pink often associated with creatures who couldn't produce skin pigment. He hung back slightly from the glass, drifting without effort. He was thirty feet long, but all Kim could see was his foreshortened, stumpy nose and his tail lifting and falling so slowly it was almost imperceptible. Hello, he said, his voice brushing across the surface of the link. Hello, Fifteen, she replied. He wasn't the brightest of the whales, and Kim often found herself frustrated by his attempts at communication. Fifteen is me. I am Fifteen. Where's Adonai? she asked him. Adonai is... above. Where above? Kim tried to keep the impatience from her voice, but it crept in nonetheless. Stern? Aft? Fifteen bobbed slightly, the words clearly going straight over his bulbous head. Kim sighed. Most of the others were able to convey directions to her through the link, but Fifteen had never been able to get the hang of it. His thoughts were a confused tumble when they came to her. Left and up, right down forward a little, swim nine strokes, maybe... She sighed, turning around as she passed him by, and searched for Jonah or Tobias or Samuel. 
She could sense them on the link, of course, but they were distant, which meant they wanted their privacy. But she was starting to get anxious, and if she had to, she'd pull them back in, whether they liked it or not. Adonai? She called over the link. Though she was speaking out loud, the words were translated through the link. Technically, she could speak to them without speaking aloud at all, but that was much harder. The clarity that came with speaking the words out loud was almost essential, she had found, if she didn't want to confuse the whales. Or herself. She was still moving, turning, and the tanks whirled around her as she raised her head, craning her neck to take in the upper reaches of Deck Ten. She could see, beyond the catwalks and stanchions and the occasional bug-like Autobot drifting past, the beginnings of Deck Nine, before the extent of her vision was too blurred by the shadows to make out anything further. With a sigh, she turned and sprang for one of the ladders. It was easy to climb, pushing from one rung to the next with her feet, propelling herself with minimal effort from her arms. The slight lack of gravity gave her a feeling of exhilaration and robbed her of the fear of falling. It was a deceptive sensation, because she could fall and cause herself grave injury, but she doubted it would happen. Due to the lack of gravity, she had more time to react, even if she did slip, than she'd ever need to right herself. The tanks scrolled past her. A shelf of multicolored coral passed by, small mounds of marine life pulsing and waving as if excited by her presence. A stream of bubbles betrayed the presence of a whale somewhere beyond. It wasn't Adonai. The link told her this, moments before she glimpsed the long, bump-riddled back of Noah. Noah was a gray whale, and his hide looked like lichen-covered rock, deep blue mottled with creamy white. He was the most reclusive of all the whales, and didn't even acknowledge Kim as she passed. She kept climbing, her tool belt swinging against her thighs. She was about 100 feet from the floor, now 150. There were buildings on Earth smaller than this. But the scale of everything in the aquarium was so different that it hardly compared. When she looked down in this particular section, she could see all the way through Deck 11 and into Deck 12, adding over 50 feet to the chasm-like drop. But she'd never suffered from vertigo. They'd never have sent her up here if she did. With a practiced movement, she swung herself onto a catwalk by launching herself upwards and catching the railings under her hands, keeping her body straight and kicking her legs out to give herself a head start. It felt leisurely, that action, like she'd rehearsed it for years. Like a dance. Adonai said softly inside her head. You're watching me, Kim said, glancing upwards as she walked swiftly along the catwalk. A bulging section of force fields swung toward her, barely holding back the blueness beyond. It didn't even look like water. Not really. It had lost its fluidity, being cross-sectioned like this, turning into something solid. Adonai didn't reply, but Kim smiled. She knew exactly where he was now. She reached the end of the catwalk, where a ladder led both up and down. She jumped four rungs and began climbing upwards again. At the top, another catwalk, this one running along the equator of the bulge she'd passed under a moment before. At its end, the catwalk drove inwards, pressing into an innermost section of the tank, like a finger pushing into a soap bubble. The tank surrounded her on all sides, save the rearmost, the direction she'd come from. The catwalk ended in a railed platform, small enough for a single person to stand. She liked this spot. If she stood with her back to the open space, it made her feel as if she were inside the tanks. Adonai liked it too. On his side of the force field, there was an arch of synthetic rock that looped overhead, forming a kind of arbor. Coral liked to grow here, and it was a haven for glittering fish, too. Small streams of bubbles whirled around, and there was Adonai, rolling from side to side, swimming back and forth through the arch, his fins brushing the coral lightly. He'd turn, then swim back through, again and again. Only Adonai, 
of all the whales engaged in this kind of activity. He claimed it helped him think. When Kim looked at him, she saw her agong, her grandpa, who had been a perpetual pacer, back and forth, back and forth. He'd never sit down when he had something on his mind. Adonai, she said. He gave a jolt of sudden awareness that wasn't visible in his movements, but she felt like a shock of lightning through the link. He wasn't shielding his thoughts very well at all. Little one with long fins, he said. This was how he had named her, back before she'd talked to him about the expedience of single nouns. Whale song, in the case of baleen whales, and the communicative clicks and pops used by toothed whales like Odd and I, did not involve names as humans used them. At least, they hadn't, until the link was conceived. The whales aboard, specifically, had had a hard time wrapping their minds around the concept initially. I told you not to come. Why not? Kim asked. She leaned on the railing, looking through the force field. It was perfectly clear, but it was also designed in two layers, a safety precaution. There was a gap between the two of about two inches. It put a distance between her and the water that wasn't there in the glassed sections, save at the very top of the tanks. Every now and then, a soft ripple of golden or blue-tinged energy would move across the surface, signifying a fluctuation in the field's harmonics, a necessary function to keep the field's strength from dissipating under the several tons of water and all it contained. Adonai, I can feel your agitation. You are not supposed to. If I don't want it, I don't want it. So go. I can't go, Kim replied evenly. I'm the caretaker, remember? It's my job to make sure you're all right. Adonai swam back, looped himself over with a flick of his tail, and swam forward once more. The coral swayed a moment after. The link glowed on his blunt forehead, a network of golden lines that was a larger reflection of those on her own shaven head. I don't want you here, Kim. Adonai's voice was heavy in the link. It was the equivalent of him yelling at Kim, but it sounded petulant rather than aggressive. Kim gave a soft smile. He rarely used her name, and she had shared her real one with him, with all of the whales, out of necessity. The link allowed her to hide her thoughts when she needed to, but she had never seen the necessity, nor felt the desire to conceal her real name from the whales. Who would they tell? They couldn't talk to anyone but her. Like it or not, she said, I'm here. So tell me, maybe I can help. I, he began, moving his fins backward as his blunt-nosed head poked through the arch, stopping himself just before the force field. I do not know how to describe this thing that is wrong with me. I get it, Kim said. She reached for her tool belt and removed the smaller tuner. Maybe talk around it. What were you thinking a few minutes ago, when I first felt the disturbance? I... Adonai began again. I was thinking about the stars. Are you going to tune my link? The stars? Kim blinked. She hadn't expected this. What about them? You told me about the stars, Adonai said, still hovering in front of her. He was only a few feet away, his head so huge he could swallow her whole. He was a sperm whale, and the largest remaining. His skin was glossy and a deep bluish gray, mottled with lighter silver patches. His eyes sat low on his head, just behind his jaw, which Kim had always thought gave sperm whales an unbalanced look. As he swung his head to the left, she suddenly glimpsed the depths of those black eyes, and was catapulted back to the first time she'd seen him, back in Skyreach's labs. He'd drawn his head back, his eye moving along the length of her body before settling back on her face. The deliberateness of that gesture 
had left her gasping and filled with the sense that, for all her study and training, she hadn't known anything about these creatures at all. She still didn't, if today's conversation with Adonai was anything to go by. Little one with long fins, do you ever go outside? Outside? Kim said, surprised. You mean outside the ship? No. You should. It's not that easy, she said with a chuckle. I can't breathe out there. I'd have to put on a suit. There's a lot of preparation. You don't want to go. No, it's not that, she replied. Though, honestly, an EV walk was not high on her list of stuff she most wanted to do at the moment. Far from it. I can't just go out there for fun. If there's an emergency or something, I'd have to, to fix the ship. But otherwise, the computer would probably refuse to let me use the resources. The come, come, commuter says whether you can go or not. I suppose so, yes. What would be made to happen if you had to go outside the ship, then? If you were needing to deal with one of these emergencies? Well, I've been trained, Kim replied, with an inward shudder at the memory. I know what to do if there's an air leak or an engine malfunction that needs to be repaired externally. I can use an external welder and most of the other tools. For other problems, there are the droids, and the computer is programmed with hundreds of thousands of scenarios and their solutions. It could talk me through almost anything. But what if there was one that you couldn't fix? Kim was silent for a minute. Adonai, where is this coming from? What if a problem happened to you? Don't worry about that. Nothing's going to happen. It was like coaxing a small child back into bed after a nightmare. Her voice had taken on a motherly croon she didn't know she possessed. She was slightly proud of herself. But Adonai continued. I couldn't protect you, Kim. Protect me? You don't need to. I'm your protector. But there is only one of you. And you are but a child in human years. I'm much older than you. And bigger. It should be me. Kim felt a pang of sudden joy mixed with sadness. She shoved it down deep. That's sweet, Adonai, but there's nothing to worry about, really. I'm good at my job. That's why they picked me. I've been dreaming of them. The leap in topic took Kim a moment to decipher, but she caught a glimpse of a kaleidoscopic image of brilliant white stars through the link, Adonai's signature thoughts mingling with it. Dreaming of the stars? Kim asked. The tuner hung loosely in one hand. She put the other out toward the force field. The field, reacting to her nearness, shimmered with small blue ripples, a warning feature built into the harmonics so that she'd know she was about to put her hand against something otherwise invisible. Yes, and I think I know what they look like. I really think I do. Tell me, Kim said. They're all different colors, like the coral, and the light they shine with. That's the light like the fish have. And they're all against black, like the sea. But they're small, and they're so cold. And that's how they'd feel. He was conveying all this through the link as he spoke, and she felt exactly what he meant by feel. Not feel as in touch, as an actual contact. No, he meant that just by looking at them, just by feeling their light on your skin, you'd have the sensation of them piercing you like needles. The sensation was so strong that for a moment she looked down at her body, expecting to see something jabbing into her. Oh, Adonai, she sighed. I would very love to see them.
he replied, his own voice drawing out as if he were a tired child. See what they're really like. I'd love to show them to you, Kim replied. But Adonai, you've got to remember that what you see isn't what I see. She lifted her arms from the railing and swept them in an arc. The water is black for you, not blue. Even the coral, there are more colors in it than you even know. And the fish, for me, aren't made of light. I can't see them at a distance like you can. So I can't even tell you what the stars would look like for you. I want to see, he answered, turning his head away. I very want to. I'm sorry, she said, and she genuinely was. She had been charged with the role of caretaker because she was a problem solver, the best of the best. To find a problem that couldn't be solved wasn't just galling. It was horrifying. She looked down at the tuner in her hand. It was shaped like a pencil, with raised bumps to make it easy to hold. She had been certain that whatever was wrong with Adonai could be fixed by a few small tweaks to his personality centers. With the tuner, she could make adjustments to the levels of endorphins in his system, driving away feelings of agitation. But the Adonai who was speaking to her didn't seem distressed. He was introspective. Moody, yes, but wasn't that part of contemplation? With a sigh, she lifted the tuner. She flicked the button on the side and aimed it through the force field. The beam was invisible until it connected with the link. The gold began to glow brighter, a pulse running along the network of filaments before vanishing. Adonai's head moved slowly from one side to the other. She hadn't been able to work out yet if he knew what the tuner did or not. He showed no signs of this knowledge now, certainly. His eyes blinked slowly, and he drifted away from her. She left Adonai, walking back along the catwalk as he flicked his tail and dived deeply, vanishing into the depths. The journey back to ground level was easy, but she took it slowly because her mind was churning over everything Adonai had said. Why was he so interested in the stars? Their conversation the day before was one she hardly remembered, They'd been talking about something entirely unrelated. The flavor of fish, she recalled. They taste like life, Adonai had told her, and she'd been surprised by this analogy. There's a name for it, she'd told him. Umami. It's not bitter, sweet, or sour. Salty, yes, but an underlying taste that's, well, meaty. Kind of fresh. Is that what you mean? Life. Blood and bone. Movement. That's the taste of fish. I wonder how the fish will taste for you in the oceans of New Eden. It has a lower salt content. Not significant, but it might be enough to alter the taste of the fish. What does it look like? Fish or New Eden? The planet. It looks like a star, she said. At the moment, it's so far away it looks smaller than a lot of the others. Just a ball of gas and rock hanging in black space. I wonder if the fish will enjoy it. Adonai had moved the conversation on, and there the mention of stars had ended. But somehow, somehow he'd picked up more information, pieced it together to realize that the stars were surrounding the ship, along with the vacuum of space. She couldn't recall any other occasion where their conversation had veered anywhere near to those topics, so she had to assume he'd thought up the rest himself. He'd never seen stars on his own, after all. Not even on Earth. So preoccupied with her thoughts, she'd made it almost all the way back up the ramps to Deck 3 when she saw it. Standing on one of the other ramps, two hundred yards away, curtained by enough shadows that it was impossible to tell if it was real or just some mirage made by a stray beam of light from the overhead lamps. But for a second, a split second, she was sure of it. 
there was a man there, staring at her. Chapter Two Kim's first instinct was to call out, but even as she opened her mouth, she found herself hesitating. She had been on this ship for 91 days. They'd warned her about this during training, and they'd also told her that if it happened, she would question her own ability to tell the difference between what was real and what was not. But 91 days was not a long time. She had expected to be able to go a year before the side effects of solitude started kicking in. After all, she'd been selected precisely for that reason. She was less social, more independent, and entirely rational, more so than any of her competitors. All her psych evaluations had pointed toward her ability to withstand the long days alone without issue. Still, the image before her had called all that into question. How could she claim to be unaffected when her very senses were telling her otherwise? She found solace that the rational part of her brain was the part holding her back from making a noise, from acting on her perceptions, because it was what told her that it wasn't real. While all her sense went wild, making the hairs stand up on her arms and the back of her neck prickle, she held herself in check. Shouting out, acting on the impulse, would give this hallucination a power it should not have. Likewise, asking the computer to confirm the amount of life signatures aboard. Instead, she blinked and focused her eyes on the section of ramp where she'd seen the figure. She took a step closer to the railing. There was a particular crisscrossing of shadow just behind one of the stanchions. If she squinted, it looked like a man's head and shoulders. Almost. It didn't look exactly like what she'd thought she'd seen, but she hadn't been looking at it directly. It was a mirage, her mind making sense of things only half glimpsed. Idiot, she scolded herself. Kim? The computer's voice didn't startle her, but the flood of anger she felt at hearing its intrusion did. I turned the comms off. I overrode your order 0 0.9 seconds ago, the computer replied without a hint of apology. You're not supposed to be able to do that. Kim, the computer continued doggedly. I have determined that your heart rate is elevated and your respiration has increased. Symptoms are consistent with anxiety. Are you all right? I'm fine, Kim said as she emerged from the ramp into the corridor of Deck 3. At least I was until you started spying on me. I have been given privileges to override your orders at any point when I determine your safety is at risk. Kim rolled her eyes. I wasn't at risk. I was doing my damn job. As you say, the schedule shows, however, that you have missed maintenance on several systems in the operations center, as well as the systems check on the tech droids both of which I'll make up tomorrow. I would still like to insist that you finish up early for today and return to your quarters for an extended rest period. Yeah, that's not happening, Kim said. I've got too much to do. I must insist, the computer said firmly. Kim, it is very important that you heed my commands. This is what you were charged with, as caretaker. Any more infractions must be reported to Near Horizon and to the Space Exploration Authority. This is your final warning. Bastard, Kim muttered. She reached the end of the corridor and stepped into the mag lift that would take her to deck one. Fine. I'm going to check the scanners and do an analysis. Then I'll retire. If you insist. The computer gave an approving chime. This is a good decision. Deck one was the smallest of all decks and made up the entirety of the ship's bridge. Nestled in the curved upper reaches of the massive ship, its ceiling was made of slabs of clear glass reinforced with force fields, giving a person the feeling of standing on an open platform that raced through space. There were rarely objects close enough to convey the speed at which they traveled, 
but Kim swore she could still sense their forward motion. A ring of control panels circled the space under this canopy. At the prow was a screen that could display feed from any camera on the ship. By default, it showed the forward view, the staccato points of the stars Adonai had been so concerned with. The computer's scanners picked out each star and labeled it with numerical data in green, blue, and red. She watched the figures adjusting as each point was pulled past in a slow, wavering trajectory. She didn't quite understand why Adonai was so fascinated. The stars weren't all that beautiful. Not out here. Far better to look at them from Earth or Mars, where they still had some semblance of a twinkle to them. Here, with no atmosphere to interfere with their light, they were solid and cold as chips of ice. Adonai would be disappointed, she thought, if he ever did see them on this screen. Kim took one of the chairs behind the main console in the very center, an arc-shaped desk that housed the navigation, piloting controls, external sensors, and external communication systems. She drew the kanji for begin in the air, and the console lit up as it began running her diagnostics. Clear displays were projected upwards, glowing numbers showing exactly what she expected. Ninety-one times she'd seen the same results, Everything was functioning within expected parameters, the few degrees of difference always accounted for when she cross-checked it with power usage. Computer, any issues? No issues detected, Kim. She nodded and drew the kanji for sleep to put the console back into its resting mode. Enter the data into the ship's logs. Entering. She moved to one of the outer consoles, running a diagnostic on the droids, checking their functions and ensuring all their data had been downloaded correctly into the computer's core. Another tedious task, checking numbers against one another to make sure the size of the data download packets matched those stored in their memories. Again, she moved on to another console, then walked in a slow ring around the edges of the bridge, checking life support systems, airlock controls for the external hull and the internal firewalls, sent a ping to each of the secondary control stations throughout the ship, then triple-checked the figures for the aquarium. The force fields read at 100%, with minor fluctuations. The water temperature was good, 70 degrees Fahrenheit at the surface, steadily declining to 40 degrees at the half-mile mark, then slowing, just nudging 35 degrees at the bottom. That done, she moved on to her least favorite task, Returning to the central desk, she slid her chair along the console and caught herself at the end, drawing the kanji for talk. A clicking sound echoed through the speakers positioned in the corners of the room. She drew another kanji, selecting her connection, and watched as the holographic projection displayed three dots, each one blinking successively. Connection established with WR-970, the computer informed her, a split second before a man's face appeared in front of Kim. He was an older man, his face withered and grayish, made more so by the flickering bluish tint of the hollow. She was surprised he was still serving, or rather, that he hadn't forcibly been retired. He would never give up his posting willingly, she suspected, though she'd never met the man in person. He had a presence, dour but unshakable. Speak, he said. Kim didn't like seeing him so close. She waved her hand, and the console interpreted her gesture, flinging the hollow image onto the main screen and blotting out the stars. That was better. She stood, placing her hands behind her back. She always found herself adopting this pose when speaking to the Admiral, even though she wasn't military. Admiral Mbewe, she replied. Hannah Monksman, caretaker, reporting from outbound ship Seiki, JH-2415. He waved a hand. Yes, go ahead. All systems reporting is normal, sir. No incidents to declare. My computer will be sending our ship's log to you, and my recording for today. She flicked her hand again, scrolling through files and attaching the recording she'd made earlier. Good, good, Mbewe said, sounding distracted. 
Was it just her, or did he seem more brusque than usual? He glanced to one side, as if listening to someone speak off screen. Confirmed. We have your log. The recording will be sent along to Near Horizon immediately. Thank you, sir. Permission to sign off? Hold on a second. Mbewe leaned forward, then rocked backward. He was adjusting himself in his chair. His eyes looked slightly downwards, but she knew he was looking directly at the camera, which was slightly off-center from his screen. Edgeward Station was older than Seiki by 30 years, and hadn't been upgraded since. Its position as the furthest station from Earth made the logistics of flying out new tech and new technicians uneconomical. Kim leaned forward too, unconsciously bending from the waist. Mbewe rubbed a hand across his chin. You're sure this data is correct? Kim felt herself begin to frown and schooled her expression to neutrality. He was still looking directly at her, which made it easy. What wasn't so easy was to tamp down her suddenly racing thoughts. Correct? Of course it was correct. Was there something she'd missed? Was she about to be reprimanded? Oh, please, God, no. She told herself to be calm. There was nothing they could do to her. She was nine light years away from Edgeward. But she wouldn't be forever. The scheduled rendezvous was in 15 days. She'd be face to face with the Admiral then, and he could certainly destroy everything she'd worked so hard for. I don't have any reason to believe otherwise. She said this with as much neutrality as she could, trying hard to keep her anxiety off her face. I checked through the package prior to sending it, as usual. I didn't notice any errors. Very well, said Admiral Mbewe. He inclined his head, and for a second his gaze did meet hers. He didn't seem to notice. To him, he was now looking above the edge of his screen. It was only the angle that made it look like he was looking straight into her eyes. But she felt her chest swell with fear anyway. Edward signing off. The screen went blank, and Kim felt as if she'd been kicked in the stomach. And she knew exactly what that felt like, didn't she? She tucked that bitter thought away with all her other memories of her old life. Old life, she repeated to herself as she headed for the door, as if it was something separate, as if she'd changed. I beg your pardon, Kim, the computer said. Nothing. I'm going to bed. Are you happy? The computer missed her sarcasm. I do not experience happiness, Kim. It replied as she headed for the mag lift. Kim tried to sleep, but something was nagging at her. She couldn't decide what worried her more. Odonai's strange behavior and odd questions, or the Admiral's unusual questioning of the log data. Trying to convince herself her apprehensions were baseless, she rolled over to face the bulkhead for the fiftieth time, seeking a cool spot on her pillow. The magnetic blanket was a safety precaution to keep her anchored in case of a gravity generator malfunction, and she wasn't supposed to sleep without it, but it was often too warm. She pushed it off her torso so it covered only her legs and felt the heat coming off her in waves. As a kid... She'd had nightmares about being smothered. The blanket was like a torture device for the claustrophobic, she thought. With a sigh, she reached for her bedside table and picked up her tablet. The screen produced a brilliant blue-white light in the dark room. She propped it against the bulkhead, on its edge so it was aligned with her head, and drew the kanji for secret on the back of her left hand. Manta protocol activated. The voice was soft, much softer than the thoughts of the whales inside her mind. But it was reassuring. She felt herself relax. The computer could no longer hear anything she said or record her actions until she deactivated the protocol. Dial Zane, she said. The tablet paused, the blue-white screen displaying a small loading circle. It took a long time. 
Not only did it have a small amount of bandwidth, but the tablet had to wait for Zane to respond to her connection request. She was happy to wait. It took 19 minutes, but then the screen flickered, and the image of a honey-skinned young man with dark stubble across his jaw appeared, hovering above the screen. He was so close to his own lens, she couldn't see anything of the room beyond him. What? He said brusquely. What is it? His expression was concerned. Zane, she said, her voice dropping to a whisper. She didn't know why, but she felt compelled to speak in a low voice when she made the connection to Manta. Even though the computer couldn't hear her, she always had the feeling that this was a forbidden midnight conversation, as if she were a child whispering secrets to a sibling after lights out with her parents just down the hall. I'm all right. Despite the poor quality of the image, she could see his face relax visibly, softening around the eyes and mouth. God, that mouth. She longed to meet it with her lips. Then why are you calling, honey? He drew back a little from the screen, so that she could see he was in his own quarters. His hair was scruffy, his eyes tired. He'd been working late again. You know you can't call outside scheduled times. It's risky. Her reasons suddenly felt foolish. Childish. I wanted to hear your voice. I couldn't sleep. I'm lonely. She wasn't supposed to get lonely, so she couldn't admit that. It would make her seem weak. Incapable. It would make him think she couldn't carry out her mission. The Admiral said something odd. It concerned me. What was it? He asked me if the data dump I sent him was correct. Zane looked puzzled, then shrugged. The screen pixelated. His image froze, then came unstuck just as quickly. Kim, this does not sound so unusual to me. Did he say anything more? Anything to give you grave concern? Anything that might compromise your true mission? Her true mission. Kim sighed, knowing it wouldn't translate over the low-res connection. No. Then do not worry. It will all be well. You're doing an excellent job, Kimberly. You're a brave woman. Kim felt the blush on her cheeks. She hoped the room was dark enough that he wouldn't see it. I'm not. I'm just doing what's right, she demurred. If only he knew, she thought. She'd already slipped up in a myriad of infinitesimal ways. She hoped he'd never find them all out. We all are. But you? You have made sacrifices too big to imagine. Kimberly, when this is over, you and I, I promise you, I will make you happy. Hearing him say those words made her heart melt. She had always considered herself to be independent, to not need another person. She'd had to teach herself to survive on her own at a young age, and she'd spent her subsequent years keeping everyone else at arm's length. What was it Constantine had said to her once? You're a little pufferfish with deadly spines. You spike anyone who gets too close. She chuckled inwardly as she pictured her old mentor saying it, as he had so many times. But with Zane, it was so different. She wanted him. It was that simple. And that complex. You need to get some sleep, Kim said. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have called. No, I'm glad you did, Zane replied. Now I can sleep with your pretty face in my mind. He smiled, his white teeth showing brilliantly on the screen. He lifted a hand to his lips and pressed it to the screen, covering the camera with his fingers momentarily. She did the same before he terminated the connection. She slid the tablet back onto the bedside table and drew the kanji for secret on the back of her hand once more. Deactivated, chimed that soft little voice. But though Zane's dismissiveness of the Admiral's behavior made her less concerned, she still did not feel sleepy. 
Eventually, she used a trick she'd devised, but wasn't proud of. She focused her attention inwards on the link. She could feel the whales drifting, peaceful and calm, in the tank. She felt the blackness of the water around them as the lights turned down to simulate night. True blackness this time, not just the blackness of their vision. Whales could tell night from day, nevertheless. They could feel the shifting of temperatures, and they were overall more attuned to rhythms than any human. Morning came, and the chiming of the alarm dragged her from an exhausted doze. She felt fuzzy-headed as she heaved herself from her bunk, wishing she could dive back in and while away the day doing nothing for once. But here, her own mind was her worst enemy. She'd drive herself insane. And out of the bed before the day was done, even if the computer allowed it, which it would not, so she might as well get on with it. Kim's quarters were luxurious by her standards, though she knew they'd be considered utilitarian by anyone other than military personnel. Her bunk was against one wall, and the opposite was taken up by a wardrobe set into the bulkhead. Between them was a door that led into a bathroom in stainless steel. The lights flickered on as she entered, a mirror over the sink displaying her reflection back at her. She looked almost as gray as the Admiral, she thought, turning aside in disgust. She missed her long, almost black hair. The lack of it made her ears stick out, and her chin look far too sharp. The link pulsed golden beneath her scalp, a network of glowing veins. At least her gang tattoo was gone. She'd lasered it off as soon as she'd heard she was through the first stage of testing, under Constantine's command. It had felt like a betrayal at the time, of Cons, of Seamus, Nikki, and the others. But at the same time, she'd been glad to see it go. Glad not to belong to anyone any longer. She showered, making the water as cool as she could without it actually being cold. The warm air of the dryers washed over her, lifting the moisture up through the vents above to be recycled by the life support systems. Wrapping herself in a towel, she moved back into her bedroom and headed for the wardrobe. There, she stopped still. The door to her room was open, the light of the corridor spilling through. She jumped, looking left and right, scanning the room. Nothing out of place. There was nothing that could be out of place. She had no personal effects on board. But the blanket, the damned gravity blanket, was pulled up over her bed. She raced to the door, clutching the towel with one hand. She looked through, left, then right. Left led to a storage locker, then a blank wall. Right led to the mag lift and another curving corridor that contained the galley and the mess. She stopped still, knowing that anything moving would make a sound she'd hear on the metal deck plates. The ship hummed back at her, a soothing melody that told her not to be silly, though it sounded louder and more intense because of the blood pounding in her ears. Computer, she said. Did anyone enter my room? That's a strange question, Kim. The answer is, of course, no. None of the Autobots? You're sure? Certain, Kim. The cleaning droid will attend to your room at 0900 while you are on duty. Kim backed her way back into the room. The door hissed shut behind her without protest. I'm going crazy. Is something wrong, Kim? I am detecting an elevated heart rate. No, she replied. Everything's fine. She stared down at the bunk. The blanket was pulled slightly to the left, draped wrinkles showing where one corner had been tugged harder than the other. An Autobot didn't do that. Unless it was malfunctioning, it wouldn't accept that the blanket had been properly aligned, and would use its nine arms to evenly distribute the fabric until it showed no wrinkle or crease. You're being stupid, she told herself. You pulled up the blanket. She must have done it unconsciously and forgotten about it, but she didn't usually do that. She left it for the droids. It had become a habit, 
something she'd told herself she'd never do, even when Erica had explained to her that it wasn't necessary to do any housekeeping herself. Her mind should be reserved for more important tasks, she'd said. But Kim had scoffed, unable to think of a time she'd been so lazy she'd leave cleanliness in the hands of robots. But she'd soon fallen into the trap anyway. Why waste time and energy? She had other tasks to do, and besides which, it gave the Autobots a purpose. She'd often found them drifting after their rounds, looking forlorn, or vacuuming dust in an area that had already been vacuumed. She told herself it was for their sake rather than hers, and then she became one of the very people she'd always despised for their slothfulness. Okay, so this morning she'd slipped back into an old routine. Simple. She'd pulled the blanket up as she slipped out of bed. But then, why the door? Computer, what time did the door open? 0713.4, it replied promptly. And what time did I enter the bathroom? Approximately 0712.5, it replied. Kim sighed. She'd triggered the door herself without realizing it. It should have shut automatically when she didn't exit, but that could be explained as a malfunction in the sensors. She'd check them out later. Her thoughts brightened at having the idea of having something else to add to her schedule. Anything for a break in routine. She opened the wardrobe and pulled out one of the jumpsuits that were her only option, then dropped the towel and stepped into the garment, pulling the sleeves over her arms. She'd chosen white today, though it looked no different from the others. It was her favorite. She kicked the balled-up towel into a corner as she pulled on her boots, then scrunched the blanket a little more, just so that the Autobots weren't completely bereft when they came by on their rounds. She even chuckled a little to herself as she left. It was only when she was halfway down the corridor that she realized she'd spoken to herself twice, and the laugh had come out aloud. After all her affirmations that she wasn't yet falling into the traps of solitude— it appeared that she was less in control of herself than she'd imagined. Chapter 3 Hi again! You all know my name's Hannah Monksman by now, so I won't introduce myself again. Oh, wait, I just did! <laughs> so, how's life on Earth going? Hope the weather's holding up. You kind of start to miss the weather out here. The ship's temperature only varies by 0 0.8 degrees, and there's no sun or clouds. Sometimes I go down to deck nine and lie under the sun lamps, though. It helps to pretend I'm on Bondi Beach. That's in Sydney, Australia, for those of you who don't know. It's one of the few beaches that survived the rising water level, thanks to the Pacific seawall. I just love that place. So, anyway, the whales are doing great. I've got some footage of Jedediah, one of our baleen whales, a dwarf sperm whale, doing some of his tricks. He seriously thinks he's an acrobat. Check it out. In the meantime, we're all still doing great. We're all excited and looking forward to what we'll find on New Eden. You can post any questions you've got on Near Horizons Art Project page. And if I've got time, I'll answer a few. Love you all. Hannah, signing off on the morning of July 4th, 2078. Kim was keeping her attention on Adonai. While she didn't feel any spikes of angst from him, as she had the day before, she did sense a slight unease. She wanted to go back down to the aquarium, but she knew the computer wouldn't allow it a second time in two days. She'd never been too concerned about the computer's insistence that she stick to routine tasks. She hadn't felt restricted by it before. She hadn't had cause to. There was work to be done, and she was the one to do it. But today the constraints chafed at her. She tried to send soothing thoughts to Adonai as she worked, but she could feel a distance between them that she didn't like. Adonai, I'm here. You can tell me anything you like. There is nothing I wish to talk about at this time. Really? Not even the stars? The stars are beyond me. As you said. That doesn't mean we can't talk about them. You can ask me questions, if you like. 
I'll do my best to describe how they work. The point being what? Kim sighed. She would get nowhere with him in this mood. And as much as she hated it, she couldn't do much to change it. She talked to Hosea instead. Hosea was a small baleen whale, only 30 feet in length. Normally, bowhead whales could reach up to 45 feet, but Hosea had been born with multiple genetic defects. She'd only been cleared for the journey by a slim margin. Kim was tasked with keeping a close eye on her health, particularly her heart. She had a weakness there that made her survival uncertain, but she'd managed to weather the acceleration out of the soul system well enough. Humans have only two eyes, yes? Hosea asked. Yes, Kim replied. She was used to odd questions like this. Whales didn't pay much attention to the physiology of species other than fish or other marine creatures. They had no need to. And while Adonai remembered things much better than the others, Hosea was a little slower. Like whales, she said. We have some similarities, Kim agreed. She was polishing one of the maintenance droids. It had been down in the engines and had come out covered in grease that was trailing all over the floor as it hovered back to its charging station. We can swim, too. Why never you swim with us? Kim laughed. I'm not sure that's allowed. But you could, the whale insisted. There are access panels in the tanks, Kim conceded. But I'm pretty sure it'd be frowned upon. And what would happen if something went wrong with the ship while I was in there? Or with one of the other whales? I'm the caretaker. I have to look out for you. You being a good caretaker, Hosea said. But not that reason I asked about the eyes. No? Kim rubbed at a stubborn spot with a rag, then gave up and reached for the can of degreaser. Her mind was wandering, thinking about her orders. There was nothing that said she couldn't enter the tank. In fact, there was scuba equipment in the storage rooms and a mask hanging on each deck, should she need to enter the tank for any emergency. But going in just for fun, well, that was another thing altogether. Sometimes I feel like I am watched. Kim stopped still. Watched? Hosea was silent. It must be one of the other whales, Kim suggested. Hosea's doubt was apparent through the link and made Kim shiver with unease. She had felt the same thing this morning, had she not? Until now, she'd successfully pushed it from her mind. I have a lot of work to do, she told Hosea, more abruptly than she'd meant to. Hosea, chagrined, drew away. Kim wanted to apologize, but she didn't chase her. Sighing, she finished with the droid and sent it on its way. The computer chimed in with her next task. But now that this feeling had been recalled for a second time, it was harder to put it from her mind. Kim spent the rest of the day attending to the tech droids. She had worked up the energy to take the ramp down to deck 13. In her mind, she saw the image of the man. She had assumed it was a man, in any case, mainly because of its height. It was a silly assumption. She'd only seen it from a distance and for a fraction of a second. It could have been a woman. But then she scolded herself for that thought. It wasn't anything. Just a trick of the light. There was no one else aboard. She wasn't easily spooked, and the fact that she would even hesitate made her think this was something worth worrying over. But in the next second, she told herself to get over it. She was a fighter. If there was danger on the streets, you didn't run from it. It'd only find you somewhere else, somewhere you were less prepared. No, Constantine had taught her this. You picked the battleground. Then you won. And so she buckled her tool belt and made her way down the ramp. She kept her eyes wide, but the shafts of light shining through the stanchions and curving ramps showed nothing unusual. Pausing on deck nine, she peered into the aquarium's upper reaches. 
the blue glow of water rippled against the bulkheads soothingly. She let her mind sift through the sensations of the link and brushed gently against the minds of the whales. Nothing untoward. Fifteen was chattering away to himself. Hosea was humming some low, mournful tune. Salome and Jonah were dancing, circling one another in a version of tag. They were all satisfied with their current level of food, temperature, and level of activity, which made Kim feel a little calmer in turn. Deck 13 closed over her head as the aquarium tanks bottomed out and moved into the filtration systems. The ship was a lot noisier down here. She drew a kanji on her hand for music and swiped her fingers from her knuckles to her wrist to bring up a menu at the side of her vision. She scrolled through to something discordant that sounded better when played loud enough to cover the deafening vibrations. Something Constantine would play in her apartment on a late night after they'd come back from clubbing, high as kites, partly thanks to stims, but mostly because of dodging the security patrols with faked curfew passes and feeling empty after the pounding rhythm of the dance floor. She eyes me like a Pisces when I am weak. I've been locked inside your heart-shaped box for weeks. I've been drawn into your magnetar pit trap trap. It was an old song by a turn-of-the-century band called Nirvana. Kim sang along with it as she walked down the corridor. This one was smaller than those above, and though she wasn't tall, she had to duck occasionally to avoid hitting her head in the pipes that snaked overhead. She reached a steep set of steps leading down to the left and slid down the railings without touching her feet to the risers. Kim, the computer burbled at her. Please adhere to safety guidelines. Shut up, she replied, singing it into the chorus as the music swelled around her. It couldn't drown out the computer, unfortunately, since both were operating through the neuro connection inside her own head, and it was impossible to turn the music up louder than the computer. Another safety precaution. Still, it made her feel a little rebellious. Just a little. She was in one of the side wings now, close to the curved bottom of the ship. The thrumming of the engines and other machinery that kept Seiki alive was all around her. She turned the music up another notch. It wasn't possible to injure your hearing with a neurocom, after all. The tech droids were lined up against the arc-shaped bulkhead, which corresponded with the outer hull. A small airlock was directly ahead, like a mouse hole in the wall, and there were six droids to one side, six to the other. They were nestled in little egg-shaped containers, open at the front, bodies folded like baby chicks with knees drawn to their chests and heads bent forward to their chests. Normally sleek and silver, they'd accumulated a coating of dust since she was here a week ago. She walked to the end and stopped in front of the twelfth one. Power up, she said. The droid responded immediately, uncurling its head, unfolding its fingers, and propelling itself gracefully through the ovoid hole to stand to attention before her. The tech droids were more advanced than most droids. Their forearms contained multiple tools that could be unfolded as required, and they were in human form, the better to correlate to the control rig should they need to be operated by a human for some task or other. She wiped the droid before her with a rag, then pulled a slender diagnostic tool from her tool belt that beeped as she passed it over the droid's body. Its oil levels were good, central processor responding as normal, and it pinged the computer successfully at 99 kilobits per second. Turn left, Kim commanded. The droid obediently lifted one leg, stepped left, then pivoted to face the required direction. She repeated the tests, having it bend over, lift its arms over its head, then perform a small shimmy left and right. Computer, you're relaying all this through the rig and ops? Indeed I am, Kim. Everything looks normal. The rig is responding as expected. One down, eleven to go, Kim said with sarcastic cheer. That evening's transmission went without incident. Admiral Mbewe made no reference to his strange question last night and signed off with his usual curtness after she'd transmitted the data logs. 
She finished the night by fixing the door sensor in her quarters, trying to find the fault that had caused it to open unbidden earlier. When she dismantled it, she found a small amount of dust inside. That could have caused a malfunction. The computer dimmed the lights and she climbed into bed, but she felt far too awake for sleep. She tried letting the link take her over, immersing herself in the blue-green water world of the whales and their soft, distant song chatter. She found herself drifting off, only to wake with a start. She'd heard a noise. It wasn't unusual. On a ship this size, it would be more surprising if there weren't random noises that sounded without warning. But this noise was different. She was sure of it. She sat up, heart pounding, which only made it harder for her ears to discern the out-of-place sound. She strained, listening, then told herself not to be stupid. Immediately, she kicked off the gravity blanket and sat up. Barefooted and dressed in her nightshirt, she went to the door. It hissed open obediently, revealing the corridor beyond. Lights flickered on slowly, reacting to her movements and making her blink. Her room remained stubbornly dark, locked in nighttime mode by the computer, until either her morning alarm sounded or she overrode the commands. She stood in the corridor, looking left, then right. Nothing. Nothing. She was about to head back to bed, telling herself she was being ridiculous, when another noise sounded. This time, she zeroed in on the direction and began to walk toward it. It had sounded as if it was coming from the mess, or perhaps the galley. Kim, the computer said, startling her. Her hand made the shaky kanji for silent, and she whispered, Computer, is there anyone else aboard? That is the second time you have asked this odd question in two days, Kim. Have you taken a mental health session lately? I am becoming concerned. Kim grimaced. Great, now the ship thought she was crazy. She continued to move toward the mess door. It had only been a few hours since she'd eaten her dinner there. She hadn't noticed anything unusual. No open vent gratings that might bang around when the air cyclers kicked in. No loose cans that might have toppled over. Or open cupboard doors that might have swung shut. Rats? She'd had rats in her flat once. They'd eaten and pooped all over a week's worth of groceries. It wasn't impossible. The ship was huge, and even though Near Horizon had put her through hellish decontamination procedures, as well as everything that had come aboard, a parasite might have boarded, and could have been breeding in the walls or in the warmth of the lowest decks. She kind of hoped it was rats. In fact, she could deal with rats. She remembered setting the traps in her flat, finding the flattened furry bodies in the morning, paws curled and tails limp. She'd dropped them into the garbage bag with satisfaction. Were there any rat traps in the supplies? She could easily make some, if not. The door to the mess was just ahead of her. Even though it was faintly ridiculous, she pressed her back to the wall, edging closer as quietly as she could. The grill work of the deck plates cut slightly into the soles of her feet. Not as much as they would have if they were at full G, though. But the metal decking was silent without her boots clomping. She reached the jam and turned her head, craning her neck to see through the gap. Nothing. Just the stainless steel cupboards, the hooded sink, and the dishes in the auto washer, where she'd left them. Wait. Two dishes were in the rack. One was missing. Her heart stuttered. There were usually three. A small plate for lunch, large one for dinner, and a bowl for breakfast. She hadn't put one away. She never did. She left it in the rack so it was there for tomorrow. She took in a deep breath. Her shoulders lifted and her chest swelled. She wished she had a weapon, but there was nothing she could do about it. She had her fists. That would have to be enough. There were times when it had been. 
And yes, some of those times had been against other unseen, unknown enemies. Though what kind of enemy she was facing here was beyond her comprehension. There was no one else aboard except the whales. As the computer had told her, this entire situation was impossible. And yet here she was. She exploded into motion, stepping into the doorway and shouting, Who the hell are you? She stopped still. Looking back at her was one of the tech droids. It was a human form machine, not a maintenance droid or an Autobot. Its silver plating glinted in the overhead lights as it stood in the alcove behind the table where there was a stovetop she rarely used. It was spooning something from a steaming pot into a bowl. Now that she was in the room, the scent hit her like a shockwave. Spices, the tang of vegetables, meat. She hadn't smelled any of these things in so long it made her instantly nauseous. The droid turned its head, revealing a long face, ovoid in shape, two glittering gold irises for the eyes, a raised triangle for the nose, and the faintest impression where the mouth would be. A breastplate devoid of markings, two arms fitted with lifelike hands. Wiring was visible at each of its joints, but an effort had been made to disguise it by coating it in silver plastic. It was taller than her by at least eight inches. She sensed no malice, but the utter incongruousness of the situation jarred Kim's reflexes. Her fight-or-flight instinct warred with her disbelief. Finally, she managed to stutter. What are you? Greetings, Kim. My designation is 4947. Kim stood stock still. Her mind was racing at light speed. A four-digit code. This was definitely one of the tech droids. But why was it operating autonomously? It had been, what, five hours since she'd run her checks, and there hadn't been any sign of an issue. The computer could activate the tech droids, but only in times of emergency. The computer could also control them, or Kim herself could, using the motion capture rig and ops. As she'd explained to Adonai, they were the reason she'd be unlikely to ever need to go EV personally. But what, what the heck was it doing in her galley? Cooking? What is that? The droid lifted its head in a very human gesture, as if pleased to be asked. Chicken soup, it said. Cooking chicken soup? If you would have a seat, Kim. The droid asked her, turning with a jerky motion and placing the bowl on the table. The enamel object bounced against the hard tabletop, and some of the broth leapt out, yellowish against the white faux wood laminate. I, Kim began, I'm going crazy. No, you're not, the droid replied. It sounded, if such a thing was possible, anxious. There was something about the tone that was incredibly familiar. Computer, Kim barked. Why is a tech droid in the galley? There are no tech droids in the galley, the computer answered. Kim, you are awake much earlier than your nominated time. I suggest you return to your bed to ensure you are not fatigued by the time you start your duties for- I suggest you shut up, computer, Kim snapped. She pressed a hand to her forehead. Then, very deliberately, closed her eyes. When she opened them, the droid was still there. Computer, there is a tech droid in the galley. I'm looking right at it. There is no tech droid in the galley, Kim. Kim let out a frustrated sound. Her instinct was to go back to her quarters. But what good would that do? Was she hoping that when she came back out, the droid would be gone? I assure you, Kim, I am real, the droid said, as if reading her mind. I'm sorry if this is causing you agitation. Perhaps if you sit down, we can have a conversation, and I can explain. 
The suggestion was so reasonable that it was funny. Kim let out a bark of laughter. Okay, she said. Fine, I'm going to sit down, and you're going to tell me exactly why you were activated and what the hell is going on here. The droid took her at her word and pulled out the chair behind the bowl of soup. It waited patiently for a few seconds before Kim realized it was holding the chair out for her. Warily, she crossed the floor, and it was only then that she noticed the mess on the bench. Pieces of chopped vegetables had rolled into the corners. Leftover chicken sat in fat, pinkish slices. The pot had boiled over, spattering the stovetop. At least the droid had turned the heating element off. Kim turned her body so she could fit between the table and the cabinets without getting too close to the tech droid. It slid the chair under her as she sat. Kim felt a strange sensation. She'd never had such an action performed for her in her life. The droid moved around the table. Its steps were clumsy. Given the mess it had made of the galley, it seemed to be running on its basic programming. Kim knew a little about how the tech droids worked. They could perform mechanical operations on their own, with input from the computer to aid their work. So yes, the tech bot could easily have chopped vegetables and chicken, poured water into a pot, and turned on a heating element. But no tech droid was designed to undertake these kinds of tasks, not without major tinkering to its programming. Kim could have done it, and relatively easily, all it would take is a few adjustments to the droid's programmed tasks, really. But the fact was, she hadn't. Those clumsy movements, too. They weren't normal. Tech droids worked with precision. They had to, to be able to handle tools and obey complex instructions. They were more adept than a human, with a lesser margin of error. Had this one malfunctioned? Been infected with a virus? If so, she could have a major problem on her hands. But the tech bot wasn't displaying signs of virus infection apart from the jerky movements. Its speech was lucid and coherent. It had performed the task of cooking the soup without incident. It was speaking to her. But that was another issue. It was using her name. Her real name. Kim. Not Hannah. Yes, it could have gotten that information from the computer, but the computer, for its part, was not recognizing the droid. What did that mean? Apart from the fact that she was an idiot for giving the computer her real name at all, this could be dangerous. She needed to keep the droid talking. It pulled out the seat opposite her and sat down. I've wanted for a long time to see you properly, Kim. You're very beautiful. Kim's heart skipped a beat. What, what did you just say? You're very beautiful, the droid repeated. Did I say something incorrect? No, she said. Before that. You've waited a long time? You mean, you've been watching me? Oh. The droid placed its hands in its lap demurely. I am sorry. Deeply. I thought you would have recognized the being that is me. I thought you would know my name, as I know yours. I'm speaking of real names, of course. It paused. But you are now not so much little, little one. Perhaps... The realization slammed into Kim like an air car at high speed. Adonai? She stared at the tech droid incredulously. Seriously? I thought your happiness would be bigger, the droid replied. Its shoulders shifted slightly, its voice a little doleful. I thought I would impress you. Kim looked down at the soup in the bowl in front of her. The smell was still assaulting her, but her stomach was starting to rumble. I can't believe. Ah, oh, I understand. I've shocked you. That is all right. I'll give you some time to get used to the idea. We can sit here as long as you like. But Kim was already searching through the link, 
sifting through the dull babble of forty-three whale voices, trying to find the one that had always spoken the loudest. She brushed it at last, but only lightly. The data was there. Respiration, normal. Heart rate, normal. Motion, normal. Adonai? She said aloud. There was no response from the link, but the tech droid in front of her cocked its head to one side. I am here, Kim. There is no need to use the link. Your body's still there. In the tanks. You're still breathing. And eating, from what I can tell. But you're not answering the link. I do not know exactly how it has worked, Kim. I'm not human. But I have established control of this droid. He sounded proud. Kim pushed herself back from the table standing abruptly. No way, she said. Kim, please, sit down. The last thing I wanted was to alarm you. Kim paced away from the table. You've somehow uploaded your consciousness through the link, she said. You must have used the neural pathways to gain access to the computer. It's the only way you could have transferred your yourself into the cognitive core of the droid. She turned. How are you manipulating it? God, what have you done? I've given myself a body, Kim. That's all I wanted. I'm sorry if I've upset you. Upset me? Kim gave another bark of laughter, this one sounding slightly hysterical. You have no idea. The droid's head dropped sadly. I'm sorry. I should have asked you, but you would have said no. Of course I would have. This is, this is dangerous and stupid. Adonai, you could have killed yourself or left yourself brain dead, or maybe you have. Have you even thought about that? Yes, the droid replied stubbornly. Of course I have. It was worth the risk. What was worth the risk? Kim demanded. She marched back to the table, placed both hands on it, and stared into those golden eyes. What exactly did you think you were getting out of this? I, I, my little one with long fins, the droid replied, haltingly. I wanted to see you, really see you, not through the walls of the tank. I wanted to see all of this. It lifted its hands, fingers splayed, indicating the room, the bulkheads, the ship. Can you understand? Kim shook her head. This is because I told you about the damned stars? No, I have wanted this for much longer, before I understood about the stars. When I was in the time before, the locked-in place the Yokohama Institute. He was remembering Dr. Jin's laboratory, where he and the other whales were implanted with the neural matrices of the link, where she herself had been implanted with the golden filaments, where she had first seen Adonai, silent and huge, floating in a tank along with the other whales. Oh, God, Kim said. She didn't know what else to say. At a complete loss, she returned to the table, sat down, and looked at the soup. Her taste buds awakened with a painful pang. It must be close to her normal waking time by now. I thought I would make you breakfast, he said. I thought we'd have a meal together. This is what humans do? I found reference to it in the computer archives. It helps ease conversation. Kim continued to look at the soup. You're a droid, Adonai. You can't eat. I don't need to, Adonai said. But that doesn't mean I can't enjoy watching you. I would like to make you happy with a meal, Kim. It is a thank you. You've looked after me. You are my caretaker. Caretaker? Kim turned and reached for a drawer 
sliding a spoon from within and turning back to her bowl. Oh, Adonai said, I forgot that you do not use your hands to eat. I apologize. I would have placed out the utensils otherwise. Kim could not reply. She dipped her spoon into the soup and lifted a small piece of chicken to her lips. With sudden abandon, she put it in her mouth, chewed and swallowed. The incredible sensation of eating real food for the first time in three months almost made her weep. It tasted like... like life. Is it all right? Adonai asked her, that anxious tone back in his voice. Yeah, his voice, not its. She couldn't think of Adonai as anything other than a being. Adonai, she said, when she could speak. Where on earth did you get chicken from? Chapter 4 Adonai watched her finish the entire bowl, then fill it again from the pot on the stove. The pleasure of eating was something she hadn't expected. Kim had been hungry before many times, far hungrier than she was now, and the soup was not perfectly made. There was too much salt in it, slightly too many diced carrots, of which she wasn't a fan. Still, she didn't stop until there wasn't room for any more. The feeling of a full belly made her sluggish, but clear-headed. She felt her entire body waking up as if from a very long sleep as it processed the nutrients she had obviously been lacking. Space rations met basic requirements, but that was all, and she'd probably not been eating enough of them, or in great enough variety either. Having an audience made her uncomfortable, but she could hardly tell him to go away and a large part of her felt comforted by his presence, despite the oddness of the situation. You've been alone too long. She pushed the thought aside once more. For God's sake, she'd expected to be alone for the entire journey. Almost a year. How could she be acting like this after three months? When she was finished, the computer chimed at her. Kim, you've begun your day earlier than scheduled. Would you like to add some additional tasks to today's roster? I'd like to take extra time to do my normal tasks, Kim replied, glancing at Adonai. That is not an efficient use of time, Kim. Adonai tilted his head to one side. This man is bossy. Kim let out a snort of laughter. The computer, however, did not detect that Adonai had said anything, and continued. I would recommend a check of the engine compartment. There are no urgent chores, but a small drop in oil pressure has been detected. It would be advisable to visually observe the leak and determine the cause. I would also advise undertaking your exercise routine. I have noticed a decrease in your overall fitness level, and this would also help with your sleep cycle and the anxiety I have detected. Thank you, computer, Kim said. Great. Not only did she have to work out what to do with Adonai, but now she had extra jobs to fill her day. Kim, the computer added hesitantly. I have detected that you are talking to yourself. When? Kim asked immediately. A small incident yesterday and the day before. It paused a second, then replayed her own voice through its speakers. Old life. Kim relaxed. The Manta Protocol hadn't failed her. The computer had only detected her odd comments to herself. This was good, but puzzling as well. It must be detecting Adonai's voice. You don't detect any replies, then? I do not understand. Who would reply? There is usual activity on your link, however. Perhaps you mean your communications with the whales. Yes, that was exactly what Kim meant she thought, looking at Adonai. But if the computer didn't detect him speaking aloud, through the droid's vocal processors, and it should have, since there were microphones in every room and corridor to pick up any verbal commands she might relay to the computer, 
then that could only mean it was continuing to believe that Adonai's conversation with her was merely occurring through the link, which it could not monitor, at least not to the extent it could monitor the ship. While the aquarium's support systems could be checked, oxygen levels, water temperature, supply from the fisheries, and this information was shared through the link, cognitive information could not be shared. Everything that was said between her and the whales was private, because there was no way for the computer to translate the emotions and feelings that formed the basis of communication via the intricate neural network. I would also like you to undertake your mental health session, Kim. The computer continued. I do not want to alarm you, but I must remind you that your psychological welfare is very important. I will put through a request for counseling when we contact Edgeward Station this evening. Is that necessary? It is procedure. You have made several strange requests over the past few days. It is merely a precaution, Kim. We must make certain you are healthy in every way. Kim shook her head, pushing back her chair. Whatever. Then, glancing at Adonai, she said, The computer doesn't see you at all. Why is that? I'm not sure, Adonai replied. I did tell this machine not to let anyone know I was here. I didn't want any of the ship's systems stopping me from doing what I needed to do. The audio, yeah. Kim could figure out how that worked. What she couldn't explain was how that could override the droid's internal link to the computer. But if the droid had been in direct communication with the computer core, then it was possible its commands had rewritten the computer's coding in a similar manner as her own bit of hacking had changed the computer's recognition of her internally. I have to go and do my job, or the computer will completely freak out, and I'll be in major trouble. I don't know what to do with you. I could accompany you. Help you. I don't think so, Kim replied quickly. You don't trust me? It's not that. Actually, maybe it is that. I don't know. Adonai, this ship is important. More important than you realize. She stopped herself short of saying anything more. The computer was still listening after all. This is all really freaking weird, and I honestly don't know what to do with any of it. Adonai looked away. I'm sorry, I did not intend making things difficult. I know you didn't, she said. Then, with some reluctance, she added, Adonai, can you show me where you got the chicken from? He brightened, his shoulders straightening, his head coming up. Yes, yes, of course. Is that what it's always called? Chicken? Kim felt a pang of guilt as she stood and followed him. An idea had been forming in her mind while their conversation had progressed, but she wasn't sure she wanted to carry it out. The chicken, it turned out, was kept in a freezer in the storage room to the left of the mess, along with many other frozen vegetables. Cupboards on either side held oils, jams, flour, rice, and even a container of dry yeast. Kim hadn't bothered to examine the room properly. She'd never had time, or reason to. The ration satchels in the galley pantry had kept her going, and she'd only ever eaten because she had to. Honestly, she'd probably have forgotten even to undertake that chore had the computer not scheduled it and ruthlessly insisted on her adherence to three meals a day. She let Adonai enter ahead of her. He was excited as he moved his body in a circle to face her. Kim knew what the droid's capabilities were with regards to dexterity. She knew all too well, she thought, rubbing her shoulder, which still twinged occasionally, and imagined he'd still have a lot of work ahead of him if he was going to get used to moving in a humanoid body. This is all good food for you, yes? Kim nodded, her thoughts elsewhere. Now that she hovered in the doorway... Indecision was making her hesitate. She didn't want to do this. And looking at the droid now, seeing him as excited as a creature made of metal and silicon chips could look, something tugged at her conscience. She shoved it away with a firm conclusion. She couldn't allow this being to roam freely on the ship. 
the computer couldn't track it if it couldn't see it. Supposing Adonai was the benign being he claimed to be, he might still blunder into Deck 15 and mess with the engines, or Deck 1 and damage the communications equipment without even knowing what he was doing. Kim couldn't risk it. This was the only choice. She stepped back and drew a kanji on the back of her left hand. Shimeru. Close. Although, actually, the meaning was closer to obstruct. With a beep, the ship sent up a shimmering wall of blue energy from the floor to the top of the door. She saw it ripple into place against each of the jams. Adonai stopped moving. Was he startled? Afraid? Angry? She couldn't tell from his blank metal expression. I'm sorry, she said. His shoulders slumped. I have to keep the ship safe, and I can't have you wandering around. She searched for explanations that would soften this, then wondered why she was bothering. For God's sake, she wasn't here to assuage his feelings. He was an intruder, and whether he was the real Adonai or not, she had to remember that. It's been eleven hours, Kim. I've been in other places on this ship during that time without you knowing. Was that a hint of accusation in his voice? Kim stopped still. Eleven hours? Yes. He stood there, his metallic body ramrod straight, his golden eyes blazing unblinkingly. Kim swallowed. Adonai, I'm sorry. You can't leave this room. Not, not yet. I have to think about this. I have to... A heartbeat passed, then another. He nodded once, slowly. Yes, Kim, I understand. The force fields on each room were designed to be activated in case of hull breaches. They met any force with an equal and opposite reaction. This was military tech. A nuclear explosion would not cause one to collapse unless the generator itself was damaged, and that was located deep inside Deck 15. There would be no breaking through it, not even with a tech droid's strong hands. She could have shut the door as well, to make doubly sure, but that felt cruel. Instead, she left him, but as she reached the end of the corridor, she leaned back against the wall. Her belly full, her mind racing, she counted her breaths up to ten, then twenty. And still, her sense of unease grew. Chapter 5 Kim, you have activated an emergency force field on Deck 5, Section 4. That's right, Kim said as she swung her way onto one of the spiraling ramps. I'm running a test. I don't detect an oxygen leakage or any other reason to test out the force fields in that section. Yeah, I just want to make sure they work, Kim replied. Computer, I need to be certain they will keep me safe during an emergency. I want to run it for a while and check that it doesn't drain any other systems. And yes, I know it was all checked prior to our departure from Ganymede, but we've been out here for... She drew the kanji for time and checked her internal chronometer, which displayed at the upper left edge of her vision in flickering violet numbers, thanks to the link. 93 days. I want to make sure everything's still working at peak efficiency. The computer hesitated before answering. That is prudent thinking. Kim checked over an Autobot that was moving more slowly than it should, ran an analysis on the operations center systems, and did a manual inspection of the pipes leading out from the fisheries into the aquarium. The fisheries were doing well, operating at peak efficiency, and the toothed whales seemed content with their meals. She preferred to do a manual inspection of the plankton levels in the aquarium itself, however, because while the fish were easy to measure in pounds, plankton and the tiny shrimp-like krill were close to being invisible in smaller numbers, it was easy for the readings on the screen to be inaccurate. It is not necessary to inspect the crustacea levels today, the computer told her. The system will alert you if the levels are too low. They are programmed to account for a margin of error. 
I've got half an hour to spare, Kim said. I can check on them, make sure they're doing okay, and be back in the operations center before the link scans are due to begin. I'd rather do it today than leave it until next week, when I'm due to check on the wiring on the nav computer. That could take all day, and it would have a flow-on effect if I took time out for the check then. Very well, the computer conceded. It is an efficient use of time. Thank you, Kim said sarcastically. She didn't tell the computer that she had another reason to want to go down to the aquarium. She took one of the spiraling ramps down to deck nine. Here, she was above the tanks, and this entire level was devoted to observation windows set into the floor. Hovering holograms displayed readouts of temperatures and oxygen levels, pressure, and maps of the whale's movements as well as the fish and plankton. Plankton couldn't be seen with the naked eye. It had taken decades to come up with a way to accurately detect their presence, and the ability to separate these readings into the different types of plankton had taken even longer. It had only happened when it was too late to save the whales. Deck Nine was one of her favorite places. It was bright at this time of day, with the artificial sunlight turned up to mimic a cloudless sky. The lamps, large conical devices set at even intervals along the ceiling, produced a lot of heat, too. She felt her skin prickle. It was nothing like real sunlight, but it was a welcome break from the comparative bleakness of the rest of the ship. Like walking from an office you'd been working in for eight hours out into the daylight. Not that she'd know about that, of course. Not Kim, anyway. An office was as foreign an environment as you could get. Hannah, though, knew all about them. She'd worked as a PA hadn't she? Kim gave a bitter laugh. She'd spent so much time imagining the life of this other girl. She was seriously afraid she'd actually become her. Now, Kim walked over the floor, looking down at the tanks. Irregular-shaped gaps cropped up here and there, shafts that led down between the sections of the tanks, holding the catwalks and ladders. Hovering just above the surface of the glass were holographic clouds of red, like a mist that didn't move when she stepped through it. The amount of red corresponded with the amount of copepod plankton and krill in the water below. Good, she murmured, stepping from one island of red to another. The plankton was growing well, and it was the right type for whales to eat healthily. She had to keep an eye out for overgrowth as well and undergrowth. Too many copepods and the artificial ecosystem would be wildly out of balance, and it could effectively form a shield over the surface of the tank water, blocking the manufactured sunlight from Deck 9 getting through to the first few miles of water. Not to mention if the less desirable plankton began to overgrow. Beyond the red clouds, the glass, three inches thick, made no noise. Unlike the clanking metal decking, it was almost solid, save for two areas at either end of the deck, where force fields hummed. With everything functioning perfectly, Kim had no need to go to either of them. But she crouched down where she was and peered down through the glass. Twenty feet of open air separated her from the surface of the water, air that had to be vented and regulated by one of the ship's systems to ensure it didn't create a bubble that would affect the water's surface. Because of the movement of air, waves were able to run along horizontally, from the front of the ship to the back, mimicking their acceleration through space. This top section of the tank was a single open space and resembled a coastal lake. It was only when you peered into the depths that you could see the aquarium dividing into its various divisions, splitting apart and merging again as it ran down through the ship to Deck 12. One whale had come to the surface, rolling lazily and blowing air from her blowhole. It wasn't water as Kim had learned during her studies, but rather hot air that condensed in the colder temperature. Some of it, less pleasantly, was mucus. It fountained up, dissipating into the air. Berenice, Kim said. Hello, Kim, Berenice replied. A southern right whale, she was slightly shy and rarely talked much. Kim always had the impression that Berenice was slightly frightened of her, in a way the other whales never were. 
Have you seen Adonai? Adonai? She could feel Berenice thinking this over. But before her thoughts reached a conclusion, she said, suddenly and slightly aggressively, What strange names you give us. Kim was taken aback, and Berenice must have felt it. You can't pronounce our true names. At least, you know them, as you know our thoughts and feelings. But they have no real translation in your mind. Do they? No, Kim said, feeling slightly unsure. This was the most Berenice had ever spoken to her at one time. But the other names, the ones Dr. Jin labeled you with back in Yokohama, aren't names at all. They're numbers. You didn't change Sakiksakus. The word itself was untranslatable, even through the link. This was true of all the whale's original names, the ones they'd been born with or given by the few remaining members of families or pods. Before being altered with human DNA, the whale's language was not something humans could understand or imitate. Kim stopped still, looking down at the massive shape below her. Of all the whales, only five species had companions of the same species, and Berenice was one of the lucky ones. Four southern right whales were in the aquarium. Kim could differentiate them, but only by using the link. Visually, they looked much the same. Rubbery, blue-black skin, growths of white on their heads like knobby lace hats. The link was etched onto her head, a golden spider's web. Berenice gave a soft sound of irritation at Kim's lack of understanding. Fifteen? You call him fifteen? Oh, Kim said faintly. Well, yes. He's kind of... I didn't know what to call him. He didn't want to help come up with a name I could hold on to in the link, either. Not the way you did. She tried to remind Berenice that she'd been complicit in the naming. If she disagreed, Kim could have chosen something else. Or perhaps she'd have been better off sticking with her number. Is that what you think? Kim crouched down. There was a cloud of red to her left, and a slowly scrolling display of steadily climbing numbers to her right. She pressed her palms to the top of the tank. You're not droids. You're living beings. You name us after people from a book. You make us into characters. Kim felt a tinge of guilt, followed quickly by a burst of anger. Not just any book. The Bible is the most sacred of all books. Do all humans think so? Most of them. Kim replied. She could tell by the challenge in Berenice's voice that she already knew about the silent war on Earth, the one that was still ongoing after all the other wars had ceased, the one that would continue to be fought until the end of time. Some religious people would never see eye to eye. Some still follow other religions, and they've got their own texts, but 61% of the population of Earth is now Christian in one form or another, Belief in God brought us together after the Triad War. It gave us something to believe in. So I chose names for you with meaning. Berenice was corrupt. A woman who had relations with her brother. A power-hungry viper. You told us her story. Kim sighed. I didn't mean that you were like her. We talked about the story, and you still said you thought Berenice was a nice name. I didn't make you choose it. I just... I wanted to know you as friends. We're not friends, Berenice retorted. There was so much strength to the statement that Kim lifted her hands. The feeling of rejection stung through her like a physical slap. She knew most of it was coming from the link. Mental, not corporeal. But in some ways that made it worse. We're too different to be friends. I'm sorry, Kim said. She meant it, too, but she couldn't pour it into the link to counteract the vehemence of Berenice's voice. The neural connection didn't work that way. 
Berenice hovered there for a moment, then, without another word, dived into the deep. Kim followed her down with her mind, but Berenice was still pushing her away, and Kim relented, giving her the space she desired. Aware that her half hour was rapidly dwindling, even without calling up her chronometer, Kim moved toward one of the holes in the deck, descending one of the ladders. She stopped when she'd reached the place she'd found Adonai the day before, and was relieved to see him there today as well. He was still swimming back and forth through the arch, the way he had then. Eleven hours. Adonai had been using the droid for half a day. How had he done it? Adonai, she said, leaning on the railing and peering through the half-gloom. The whale did not respond. He continued to swim, back and forth, back and forth. His belly was full, but his mind... Adonai? She repeated, louder. Not that it would make a difference. The link conveyed everything at the same volume, whether she was shouting or whispering. The great whale stopped swimming, and with a flick of his fins, drifted closer to the force field. Hey, buddy, she said, stretching out a hand. She let it hover just above the surface of the force field. The small blue ripples appeared, taking the shape of her hand and creating a mirror in blue lightning. She was reminded for a moment of the droid locked in the food storage room on deck five. Had he tried to escape? Once a force field was activated, it prudently covered all walls of the affected room to prevent leakage into surrounding sections. There was no way to get through the bulkheads in any direction. But that didn't mean he couldn't try. And if he did, if he was stubborn about it, he could very well end up damaging himself. Oh, Adonai, Kim said. Please don't tell me this is real. Adonai hung in the water. His head drifted slowly to one side so that one of his black side-mounted eyes was looking at her. But though she tried to convince herself it wasn't true, that she was letting her emotions get the better of her yet again, letting them warp her objectivity, she could see no real spark of life in them. She reached out with the link instead. Yes, there he was, a blue whale-sized being laid out on her internal grid. The effect was similar to the way a person could be aware of objects and walls in a room, even when you weren't looking at them directly. She felt his proximity, knew that the last time he'd eaten was three hours ago, and that he was at a comfortable temperature. But there was no brush of his mind against hers, no spark of recognition. Adonai, remember how we talked about the stars? Nothing. He flicked his fins, sending himself in a lazy figure eight back through the arch of rock, his fluke flapping at her in what would have been a dismissive gesture, if there was any emotion at all in it. <laughs> Whoa, how on earth did Adonai transfer himself into a droid? That's not supposed to be possible, right? But then maybe he's the one responsible for the weird stuff happening on Seiki. Stay tuned for our next episode of Under the Heavens as things get more complicated for Kim. So don't forget to subscribe to CamCat Unwrapped. Tune in to hear all of our audiobooks as we release them right here on CamCat Unwrapped as serialized podcasts. The first two episodes of every book can always be found here, but subsequent episodes will be available for free listening only for a short time after their release. After that, they'll be gone. But don't worry, the audiobooks are available for purchase on Audible and other major retailers. If you don't want to miss a beat, listen now on the audiobook platform of your choice. All our books are also available in print and ebook formats on camcatbooks.com or wherever books are sold. Before you go, please take a moment to leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. Thank you. CamCat Unwrapped also offers other CamCat books as podcasts. 
Also check out our interviews with authors, editors, and other bookworms, and our background episodes, where we unwrap exclusive content relating to our books. Tune in again to CamCat Unwrapped, because CamCat Unwrapped is where book lovers meet.